I have big things coming. You have no idea. Pete Campbell is the kind of guy who trades in a wedding present to buy a rifle instead. Same price as a chip and dip. Who coerces his neighbor's young au pair into sleeping with him. I went to a lot of trouble to solve your dress problem. And I think I at least deserve to see it on you. And who, underneath his clenched, sunny demeanor, is always seething about something. How are you? Not great, Bob! He's got a petulant attitude. You don't want me to have what I want and a permanently self-satisfied expression that kind of makes you want to clock him. In other words, Pete starts out as the most unsympathetic character on Mad Men. Wouldn't be a sin for us to see your legs. If you pull your waist in a little bit, you might look like a woman. But over time, the desperation that makes him so unlikable also humanizes him. I don't seem to exist. No one feels my existence. Because behind Pete's smarmy facade, there's a man who feels deeply insecure and powerless. Have you seen those pictures of Earth from space? Of course. Do they make you feel small and insignificant? He wants to make a mark, but he can't seem to break through. And most of us can probably relate to this more than we'd like to admit. So as easy as it is to look down on this character, we have to consider, what does Pete Campbell reveal about us? Please tell me you don't pity me. Before we go on, we want to talk a little bit about this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a superb online learning community with thousands of classes about everything. Bitcoin trading, playing guitar, stop motion animation. Click the link in the description below to get two months access to all classes for free. When Mad Men starts, Pete is a thorn in Don Draper's side. I think I did something good and you got the compliment for it. He's dying for Don's approval. It matters to me that you're impressed. Which makes Don even more resistant to giving it. Let's take it a little slower. I don't want to wake up pregnant. The irony is that Pete is like Don in a very fundamental way. He has a seemingly perfect life, which actually makes him miserable. I have nothing done. But unfortunately for him, Pete doesn't seem to get the consolations that Don uses to distract himself from that deeper unhappiness. Pretty much every woman we meet swoons over Don, while Pete can't even close the deal with the teen girl in his driver's ed class. Don exudes smooth confidence and control. The greatest thing you have working for you is not the photo you take or the picture you paint. It's the imagination of the consumer. While Pete makes a fool of himself. Don comes over to Pete's house for a dinner party and easily fixes the broken sink that Pete couldn't figure out. The supply was turned all the way up. Forces the valve. But it stopped the leak. That was a coincidence. And Don usually gets away with things. While Pete's indiscretions are always coming out in the most humiliating ways. Like when the neighbor he sleeps with comes running to his and Trudy's house. All I wanted was for you to be discreet. She lives on our block! Or when he sees his father-in-law at a brothel. Hello. Good night. We talked in our Peggy video about how Peggy embodies the best parts of Don. Well, Pete seems to embody the worst parts. Pete's flaws can't be romanticized because they're not masked by flawless good looks, creative genius, or charisma. Don's tortured persona is alluring, while Pete's misery just comes across as pathetic. And Pete's sins somehow feel worse to us, too. Because whereas Don had to make his own way... Aren't you trying to get a break once? Pete's been handed an easy, privileged life. I deserve it. Why? Because your parents are rich? Because you went to prep school and have a $5 haircut? You've been given everything. You've never worked for anything in your life. In fact, Pete's family name is the only reason Sterling Cooper keeps him around in season one. We lose him. We lose our entree to Buckley, Deke, the Maidstone Club, the Century Club, Dartmouth, Gracie Mansion sometimes. <laughs> it's a marquee issue for us. Even Pete's infidelities feel sadder and seedier because Trudy is an incredibly caring, supportive wife. And their marriage is much better than what Don has with Betty. This becomes a home the minute you walk through that door. Yet despite all of this, you might argue that we're kidding ourselves to feel so above the guy. Because as show creator Matthew Weiner has said, we'd all like to be Don, but actually, we are all Pete. 
everybody wants to be Don Draper, but no one really is. And if you're trying to be Don but failing, that makes you Pete. Why does it always have to be like this? Why can't I get anything good all at once? Pete's petty immaturity, insecurities, selfishness, and struggles in the rat race are all things we dislike in others. You're a grimy little pimp. But if we're honest, they're behaviors that many of us would also have to admit to being guilty of. And this is the uncomfortable way that Pete hits close to home. He reflects things we don't like in ourselves. So our visceral disdain for Pete Campbell is at least in part a reaction to this unflattering mirror of us on screen. Let me speak to the manager. Of the entire store? Of the Republic of Dresses. Pete, Don, and Roger Sterling represent three different eras of white manhood. Roger is part of the greatest generation that fought in World War II. Are you drunk? Pearl Harbor Day. Show some respect. Meanwhile, Don and Pete are part of the silent generation, people who were children and teens during the Great Depression and World War II. As adults, they were known for being career-minded rather than getting involved in activism. But even if they're technically part of the same generation, Don and Pete are almost a decade apart in age, and there are some key differences between them. How old are you, Pete? I just turned 26. I bet the whole world looks like one great big brassiere strap just waiting to be snapped. Don served in the Korean War before becoming a self-made man. Pete is in between times. He came too late to get the glory of fighting for his country and too early to become a counterculture hippie. His confusion about how he fits into his times comes across in his external transformations. He goes from having a picture-perfect marriage and a preppy style that seems stuck in the 50s to being a seedy LA 70s guy with sideburns. The city's flat and ugly, and the air is brown. I love the vibrations. I don't really dress like a hippie and talk like one. <laughs> and internally, he feels in between too. He's constantly anxious to prove himself and starving for recognition. He basically said I care too much about my clients and they notice it. How could that be bad? But he lacks purpose or true direction. He doesn't have a specific passion, really, so he tries to get in on everyone else's. He tries to pitch his own idea to a client to prove that he's creative like Don. I have good ideas. In fact, I used to carry around a notebook and a pen just to keep track. Direct marketing. I thought of that. Turned out it already existed, but I arrived at it independently. And when Ken gets a short story published, Pete forces Trudy to see her ex-boyfriend who works in publishing to try to get his own story in print. I could have gotten you in The New Yorker or in the Encyclopedia Britannica if I wanted to. So, why didn't you? Why would you do that to me? Pete's burden is heightened because his rich family sees him as a disappointment and can't understand why he struggles. We gave you everything. We gave you your name. And what have you done with it? But underneath the competitiveness, Pete's lonely and really just looking for some connection. He has a very human need to be appreciated. Did I miss something? No. Don and I talk all the time when you're not around. In fact, we're going to do it right now. When he loses the fist fight with Lane in season five, he's not just upset because he wanted to prove himself, but also because he was hoping deep down that one of his coworkers would stand up for him. This is an office. We're supposed to be friends. At the beginning of the series, Pete is stepping into a very adult life he's not ready for. He's getting married despite not really wanting to. Of course I love you. I'm giving up my life to be with you, aren't I? And expecting big instant success at work without really knowing what he's doing. You're good at your job. Cooper loves you. What's the hurry? It's been two and a half years. So right from the start, we see Pete self-sabotaging in response to these roles he doesn't feel equipped for. He sleeps with Peggy just days before his wedding. I'm getting married on Sunday. I heard that. <sighs> you must think I'm a creep. And ironically, the more that Pete's life fits the image of success, the beautiful rich wife and kid, good job, big house, the more dissatisfied he seems. His move to the suburbs triggers a dark existential crisis. Tammy could drown. What is wrong with you? I'm sorry. This doom and gloom, I'm tired of it. 
and he acts out by sleeping with a fellow commuter's troubled wife. We just happen to have the same problem. It's as if Pete can't stand this life because he feels like a fraud, a child wearing grown-up shoes that don't fit yet. Pete needs a lot of time and new, messy experiences, like working his way up the corporate ladder, separating from Trudy and briefly relocating to California so that he can gradually become the man he wanted to be at the start. Pete grows and achieves when he stops trying to make an impression on everyone and just buckles down and works hard. He impresses Don by being ahead of the curve. You've been ahead on a lot of things. Aeronautics, teenagers, the Negro market. We need you to keep us looking forward. And he becomes a true asset to the agency, much more dependable and high achieving than someone like Roger. You squeezed me off of it, Roger. You wanted it all to yourself. He would have never let this happen. So Pete's anxious insecurity leads to what ends up becoming truly impressive about him. He doesn't just rest on his laurels like other privileged white men might, because he has something to prove. Stable is that step backwards between successful and failing. With his infamous receding hairline, is he going bald? <laughs> Pete's probably the character who ages most visibly over the course of Mad Men, but he also matures more than most. In season one, one of Pete's lowest moments is trying to blackmail Don into promoting him. You're not who you say you are. And there's obviously a reason. Come on. I would like you to reconsider my qualifications. But in season four, we see how much Pete's grown when he kills an account with North American Aviation and takes the blame, all because the account could expose Don as a deserter. When all you had to do was hold their hands and jerk them off. Is that so hard to do, Campbell? By the end of the series, he's no longer an annoying suck-up, but someone who has the right to be proud of his accomplishments and who's friendly with his co-workers. We both know they're never gonna take me seriously over there. They don't know who they're dealing with. He's evolved enough to win Trudy back and give his family a fresh start in Kansas. I wanna start over. And I know I can. I'm not so dumb anymore. Pete still isn't quite the hero of the story, but he's become someone we can respect, appreciate, and empathize with. So if we all have a Pete Campbell in us, his ending point tells us that it's possible to get past those hangups and insecurities and become more. Getting the career recognition and personal happiness we crave is a much harder, messier journey than we might think when we start out. And along the way, it's easy to wish we could just take a shortcut. But Pete's arc teaches us that in the end, it's infinitely more rewarding and character building to earn that success, fair and square. We're not even through half our lives. And even if we are, we're entitled to more. This is Daniel Jose Older. Daniel is the New York Times bestselling author behind the Shadow Shaper series, the Bone Street Roomba series, and more. And he teaches a class on storytelling fundamentals on Skillshare. Don't be a perfectionist. Just put the words on the page. Tell the story. That's the rule. Tell the story. This is why we love Skillshare's service. The classes are taught by amazing, accomplished working professionals in design, photography, social media, business, entrepreneurship, and more. In fact, Skillshare has helped us at Screen Prism to learn more about animation and design. They offer 20,000 classes about any skill you might want to learn, all for less than $10 a month. And right now, you can get two months access to all of their classes for free. But that's only if you're one of the first 500 people who click the link in our description below. It's a great deal, so hurry up and don't miss out.